So I'm going to move on now to Professor Sanford Hu from, uh, from Taipei, who's going to be talking about the clinical applications of cavernous sinus approaches. Um, Professor Su is the Director for Neuro-Oncology uh, and Cerebral Vascular and Skull Base at Taipei uh, Veterans General Hospital. He's also an Assistant Professor at the National Yangming University. Uh, he, he trained in the same hospital, he's now become uh, the Director there. He's got an extensive research experience, as I'm sure you're all very aware, but including some work he's done uh, with Professor Ali Krisht and Al Mefti. Um, so I'm sure that will stand him in good stead for what's going to be a, an excellent talk, I'm sure, on the clinical application of the cavernous sinus and his approaches. Thank you again uh, for joining us, Professor Su. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sanjiva and Dr. Shen, uh, who invited me to this great event. And at the beginning, I would like to uh, introduce myself shortly. I came from uh, Taipei Veterans General Hospital in Taipei. And actually I did a fellowship two years uh, at UMS in Little Rock. And um, my uh, three great mentors, I was lucky uh, because I have uh, Professor Yasagil, and Professor uh, Mafti, and my uh, mentor, Dr. Christ. They are all uh, laureates of the Oliver Krona Award I learned the microsurgical concept the techniques from Professor Yasagil and skull based techniques from uh, Mafti. And also, I learned aneurysm techniques and cavernous sinus surgeries from my teacher, Dr. Christ. And actually, uh, with accumulation of uh, knowledge of anatomy around the cavernous sinus, more and more people are uh, actually uh, explore this area once it was recognized as a no man's area. But like Professor Schott mentioned, actually the anatomy of the uh, cavernous sinus is complex. These paras are uh, cellular venous channels, uh, actually as close related to the uh, skull-based bony structures and dura structures uh, with uh, critical uh, neurovascular structures that are straightened through. So like this picture shows uh, every uh, critical uh, cranial nerves and the artery penetrating the dura and into the cavernous sinus. So it's like a, a box. And also the, there is some important uh, cranial like a, a cranial six as you go within uh, the box and some other cranial nerves are overlying the wall of the box. But how the, the topic of my talk is um, how to turn the anatomy work into your daily routine. We did a lot of work in the lab. We memorized the term of anatomy, but most of the people, they don't know uh, what's the importance of these landmarks, which can be applied to your daily routine. So this is my, my uh, topic of my talk. When I back to Taipei, uh, based on what I learned from my teachers and based on my experience getting in less uh, 10 years. I uh, have my concept and I categorize the, the techniques of cavernous sinus surgeries. So in this slide, like uh, Dr. Shah mentioned, the cavernous sinus anatomy, you can categorize into four parts, like, uh, like dura structures, bony structures, venous channels, and neurovascular structures. Each structures, there is a, some important landmarks which you can you have to memorize you know, you have to know how to apply to your daily uh, surgeries for example you have to know how to deal with the dura propria you know that there is two layers the dura overlying the little wall the cavern and sinus and you have to know how to deal with the uh, outer ring and the inner ring and also uh, for for the bony structures the most important is you have to know how to remove the anterior clinoid. And also you have to know all the cranial nerves, which direction and which, uh, uh, what is anchored to the dura structure. You have to release the, all these cranial nerves from all these, uh, the dura structures. So in this slide, on the most uh, right side column, 
uh, if you do the cavernous side surgery, it's, it's like a building blocks. So you, you can see the block area. This is the basic approach of the cavernous sinus. It means that you have to be equipped with the basic techniques. So you have to know how to peel in the dura of the cavernous sinus. You have to know how to do the anterior clinodectomy. And also you have to be familiar with the dura ring removal. So this is the basics of the cavernous sinus surgery. Then with the standing, based on the uh, different location, the pathology and size to the pathologies, you can modify this basic approach and based on your, your uh, experience gathering, you can do the transmacos cave approach. Uh, also you can do the transcavernous approach. Or also you can do the most complex, uh, the transmacoscape, transentorion, and transmacoscape, transentorion, transpetrosal approach. So each approach uh, actually uh, specifically to uh, different parts of uh, pathologies, like uh, maybe you can do the transmacoscape approach for the type A and type D peripheral trigeminal schianoma. But most of the time, when you do the basic approach, uh, you can do a lot of the uh, pathologies pathology, uh, like a spinal ring, meningioma, tubercular, cellular meningioma, or intraorbital tumor, or most of the uh, pecan aneurysm, paraclinal aneurysm. And also if you are the equipped the most advanced techniques, you're familiar with the, all the anatomy surrounding the cavernous sinus, then you can deal with the most complex one, like the brainstem lesions or the petroclival meningioma. So I uh, categorize the learning curve in cavernous sinus surgeries. If you are a beginner, you are at the level one, maybe you have to, you start with the tubercular and cellular meningioma or sphenorrhage meningioma. And you have to do the Simpson grade one resection. And also you have to do, deal with the orthomic or pico aneurysms. But you have the more advances, like you playing the uh, video games, you get the new weapons, or you uh, learn the new techniques, you're level, you're level up. So when you're at level two, now you can deal with the clinodal meningioma, or you can deal with the more complex paraclinal aneurysm like medial ventral projecting aneurysms, or you can deal with the uh, cranial pharyngioma and also the uh, type A and D schianoma. And the most top of the level, the most difficult one, I think, is petroclival meningiomas, cavernous sinus meningioma, or cordoma. So different level. That means that you have the different techniques. So the level one, like I said, you have to know how to peel the dura off the little world of the cavernous sinus. You have to know how to do the anterior clonodectomy. And also uh, you have to deal with the dorsal ring removal and opening the optic nerve mobilize the carotid. And at the level four, the top level, uh, you have to open every windows within the cavernous sinus. And also you have to do the uh, anterior petrocetomy, mobilize in the trochlear, a uh, trigeminal nerve. And also you have to localize the, the sixth nerve within the derailleur canals. So, the most critical concept and techniques of cavernous sinus surgery, I have to simpli simplify it, is the essence of the, the surgery is unlocking it. What I said, unlocking it. Uh, like uh, my teacher, Dr. Krish, always said, unlocking the cavernous sinus. And uh, years later, I realized what it means because, like we said, all the critical cranial nerves and arteries that penetrate through the uh, dura into the jewelry box. So like you open the box, you have to like untie the ribbon surrounding the box. So for the cavernous sinus surgery, the first step is peeling off the dura of the late world cavernous sinus. Because in this way, you make every the detailed anatomy shallow. If it becomes shallow and it facilitates your manipulability surrounding the box. Then the second way, you have to remove the bony structures, the bony blocks 
in the way to your view, like an uh, anterior clinoid. You have to remove the anterior clinoid to expose the cellar and supracellar region. And also you have to free all the nerves from where it is anchored to the dura so that you can lessen and minimize the injury to the nerve. And also you can widen the window uh, between each nerve or muscular structures. Mm -hmm. So I learned from Dr. Krish. So I do uh, almost every case in pretemporal approach. It means that when you uh, dissect the temporalis muscle, you have to cut the muscle down to the zygomatic notch. And uh, more lower than the uh, traditional terrianal approach. But if you want to do the more advanced exposure of the lateral or the cavernous sinus, sometimes you have to uh, just uh, remove the zygoma. Actually, I don't do the uh, OZ or COZ approach. I just cut the uh, zygoma arch and attach to the temporalis muscle and no one has the uh, cosmetic problem after surgery. So like Professor Sharp mentioned, we have two layers of dura overlying the lateral of the cavernous sinus. And actually I always uh, I describe the dura like a shirt with two shoulder straps attached to the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. One shoulder strap is a uh, meningo orbital artery uh, is within the dura fold. Another shoulder strap is the middle meningeal artery and also with the dura fold. And with these two dura fold, the temporal dura is attached to the later world of the cavernous sinus. And you can always find the dura group just below the superior orbital fissure. So when you uh, start the peeling off the dura, you have to find the superior orbital fissure you can always find the dura groove just below it. And usually we do the uh, sharp dissection uh, just uh, precisely uh, into the two layers of the, the dura, just keep the cleavage plan. And sometimes you use the uh, uh, blunt dissection and you push the dura backward to expose the uh, trochlear nerve, the V1, the V2, and also the, the anterior clinoids. So this is uh, well known uh, and described by Dolank, Professor Dolank. If you want to do the advanced exposure of the cavernous sinus, then you turn your microscope to the middle manager artery. You find it, then coagulate and cut it. Then you expose the, the V3, then you push the dura backwards and be careful to preserve the uh, GSPN so that you push the dura anterior to posteriorly, not per perpendicular to the GSPN, so that you will injury the GSPN. So you preserve the GSPN, then you can expose the Kawase triangle. Now you can fully expose the later wall of the cap and the sinus. So this is the uh, foundation and the basic steps for you to do the cavernous sinus surgery. Since you have to do the uh, extradural work and you gain a lot of space outside the dura, so if you want to cut the dura, this is reasonable to just cut the dura along the sylvan fissure down to the base of the dura, then extend the incision and bilaterally. So you cut the dura along the sylvan fissure down to the base then they extend this bilaterally to expose the carotid artery and the optic nerve. And when you do the uh, peeling of the dura, and most of people always ask how to do the uh, hemostasis because it's always whizzing from the each windows of the cavernous sinus. So you have to know the venous anatomy surrounding the cavernous sinus. It's complex, but it's a lot of uh, collateral channels within the cavernous sinus and all over the cavernous sinus. So I learned from the techniques from Dr. Christ. I do the uh, hemostasis using the uh, T-seal. And you can push the T-seal into every uh, windows within the cavernous sinus. But when you push in the T-seal, remember just press using your sucker 
to press the sphenoparietal band to preventing the uh, glue back, backwards to flow into the, the sylvian band. Otherwise, you are causing the post-op brain swelling. And never inject the glue into the superior paternal sinus. Otherwise, you will cause catastrophe because it, it may be a compromise of flow to the uh, transverse sinus and signal sinus. Then you will be uh, uh, terrified. Something, something terrifying will happen. And remember, preserving the deep sylvian band because when you push the seal, it may transiently it occupies the venous channel. But if, it, if the deep sylvian band is keep patterns, then you won't cause any uh, venous infarction. So this picture shows you can just push the T seal uh, into the windows between the V1 and V2, or just when you uh, remove the clinoids, you can open the ocular motor membrane and inject the tissue into the membrane because this space is also belong to the cavernous sinus. Then you have to know the most important landmark is anterior clinoid. If you know that the uh, anterior clinoids have three uh, attachments, the first one is sphenoid ridge, the second one is optic canal and roof, the third one is up the strut, then you can remove the clinal efficiently. So the first step, usually I will uh, drill the spinal reach. I will remove the uh, little wall, the orbit. Then this step, I already detach the uh, clinoids uh, from the spinal wing. Then you uh, have to uh, peeling the front of the rod to see where the optic nerve is. So you have an imaginary line along the optic roof. So the second step, you drill just overlying the optic, optic roof and sclenizing the optic nerve. Then you can weaken the clinoids because it's, most of the time the optic strut is fragile. So when you open the optic roof, actually the uh, ACP the clinoid is mobilized. So you can easily to remove the clinoids step by step. If you know the three attachments for the clinoid to the skull bone. And like I said, every nerve and artery that penetrating the dura into the cavernous sinus. So this is picture showed the real uh, surgery. You can see the carotis, the optic nerve and the oculomotor nerve they all are penetrating the dura into the cavernous sinus. So when you do the cavernous sinus surgery, this is very important. Just free all this critical neurovascular structure from the dura. So you have to remove the ring or ring-like structures surrounding these structures. For example, like uh, Professor Shah mentioned, this is a phosphor ligament overlying the optic nerve, and also the artery overlying the carotid. So you have to remove the phosphor ligament or the ring to free the optic nerve and the carotid so that you can mobilize the nerve or the mobilize the carotid to widen the uh, carotical optical uh, window. So let like this picture show, if you remove the ring structure, or the phosphor lemon, then you expose the window between the carotid and optic nerve. You can find the uh, ophthalmia artery. And this is the basic step for you to deal with the paraclinal aneurysm. Also, if you remove all the ring-like structures surrounding all these nerve or vessels, you can expose the whole, uh, you can expose the whole a little wall or the roof you can open the roof of the cavernous sinus. So this picture show you actually expose the whole segment of the karate. You can see the distal karate, the siphon, and the plasmal intracavernous segment of the uh, karate because you already free the arcuomotor nerve. You can mobilize the nerve to expose the roof of the cavernous sinus. So I. Uh, like I mentioned, I, I did different uh, approach of the cavernous sinus and uh, categorize 
into four levels. So the level one and level two, this is the basic approach. And actually we're focusing on the pathology surrounding the cella, supracella, uh, interpeduncular fossa. Like this one, this is the simple case. This is the sperm-rich meningioma lateral type. I think this is the level one because the only technique you need to know is just the dura peeling. You do the extra dura peeling. Then you expose the level of the cavernous sinus and actually already devascularize the blood supplies to the tumor. Why? Because in these pictures, I do the extra dura dissection. I didn't see the tumor because the tumor is within the, the dura. But when you do the extra dura peeling, the blood supply is already uh, gone. So when you do the intradura part, you will find there's almost no blood loss from if you do the tumor removal. So you do the extra dura peeling, then you cut the dura along the serum fissure down to the base of the dura. At this stage, you still didn't see the tumor. But now you can cut the dura surrounding the tumor margin. So you cut the dura around the tumor margin. Since you already are uh, uh, diversified from the base of the dura, and you already uh, exposed the base of the dura. So you cut the dura surrounding the tumor is very easy. So you can remove the tumor on block. Then this is the post of our picture. So you, expose, you remove the tumor as long as the dura, you achieve the Simpson grade one recession. So this is the symbolic case for the beginner, you have to start with the uh, little type, the spinal ridge meningioma, because the only one technique you have to know is dura peeling. Then you have, only with this technique, now you have to do the anterior clinodectomy. You have to know how to remove the phospholipid and artery. So you can do the tuberculin cell meningioma, like this one. When you remove the anterior clinal, like I say, you remove the blocks in the view to the cella and the supracellar region. Then you remove the clinal, uh, also facilitating to expose the outer ring so that you can remove the ring surrounding the carotis and also you can remove the phospholipid surrounding the optic nerve, especially for the tuberculin cella meningioma. At the beginning, at the first step, you have to remove these ring structures because in this picture you can see, when you remove the forceful ligament, then you can see the indentation like an arrow show, the indentation overlying the optic nerve. So if you don't remove the ring, then you start to remove the tumor, you mobilize, you push the optic nerve, then the nerve is against the ring, then you will cause much of the injury to the ring related to the traction. So if you re release, free the nerve from the ring, then you mobilize the nerve and you widen the window so you can remove the tumor. So this is the very important concept for the uh, uh, tuberculin cell meningioma. And the second uh, simplest uh, uh, case is the PKI aneurysm. You just do the dura peeling, remove the anterior clinoid and just remove the dorsal side or the outer ring, expose the carotids. In this trajectory of the view, actually you can see the aneurysm and also the takeoff or the pecan. I like this approach uh, rather than the, the transylvian because if you do the transylvian approach, the trajectory of the view, the view is to the carotis, is to the dorsal aspect of carotid, not the lateral aspect of carotid. So if you, the view is to the dorsal aspect of carotid, sometimes it's difficult to see the take of the pecan. So if you can see the take of the pecan, when you put the first clip or the, put a permanent clip, you can avoid to catch the pecan. So this is very important. So this trajectory is very good for the PKI aneurysm, if you know how to do the basic approach of the cavernous sinus. Then you can do uh, the uh, simple case of the paraglinal aneurysm like uh, orthomic aneurysm. 
because this aneurysm is projecting dorsally, you just uh, do the dura peeling, anterior clonodectomy, and just remove the dorsal ring, then this, you can expose the whole segment of the aneurysm, and the clipping just uh, simulates this step of the uh, aneurysm clipping. So like this picture showed, you remove the anticlinoids, you open the dura, then you remove the ring overlying the carotis or the aneurysm. Then you can expose the whole segment of the aneurysm. And also, if you remove the clinoid, you have the space for the proximal control. Then you can put the clips uh, to catch the aneurysm easily. And also like this case, uh, like I mentioned, I always open the little world the cabin, uh, the little orbital wall, find the severe orbital fissure, do the extradural peeling, like uh, standard steps to remove the endoclinoid, cut the dura. I open the phosphor lemon to expose the upper nerve, and also I remove the outer ring overlying the aneurysm. So you have to be uh, very uh, meticulously to remove the ring structure of the aneurysm. If you didn't remove the uh, ring very well, if you put the clip, the clip will catch the aneurysm and the ring. Sometimes the ring, if you catch the ring, you will strangulate the carotid and causing the compromise of the flow. So this is very important. You have to re remove the ring totally off the carotid and the aneurysm, and then don't cause the sling effects. Otherwise, if you put a clip, you catch the ring as well, and you sometimes you found it compromised the flow of the carotid. So in this case, I put a pilot clip, then remove the ring well, then the, put the permanent clip. So this is the simple case. If you know how to do the anterior, uh, anterior clinotectomy and remove the ring. But sometimes um, you have to deal with the complex paraclinal aneurysm. So except for the uh, dura peeling, anterior clinotectomy, other ring removal, actually for the uh, different projection aneurysm, like a medial inferior projection aneurysm, you have to circumcision you don't have to know how to circumcise the ring totally of the carotid. Like this case, I would like to show. This is, I remove the clinoids and also the dorsal aspect of the outer ring. I, now I remove the dorsal aspect of the outer ring to free the carotid from the ring. And usually, uh, if the aneurysm is immediately or inferiorly projected, you can see this is a medial projecting aneurysm, and you can see the alphalmic aneurysm, uh, the alphalmic artery. So most of this case, you have to put a fenestrating clip. But if you don't remove the ring uh, totally, usually the outer ring attached to the optic strut. If you re didn't remove the ring off the strut, you cannot advance clips to catch the whole segment in the neck. So you have to cut the ring off the optic struts and you have to see the medial aspect of karate and even the proximal neck or the aneurysm. So you can see the tip didn't catch the whole segment of the neck. So you have to remove the ring totally on the medial aspect of the carotid then you free the orthomic artery, you see the proximal neck of the aneurysm, now you can advance your clip to catch the whole segment of the neck. So now you can totally occlude the, the aneurysm. And sometimes you are facing the complex large carotis aneurysm, so uh, the additional techniques is the how to do with the proximal control. Most of the people there are uh, concerned about the proximal control, then they open the neck, carotid, 
or maybe they can uh, do the uh, petrosetomy to expose the petrosal carotids. But I will show you the simplest way if we know how to uh, open the cavernous sinus. Usually I prepare the space in Parkinson triangle for the uh, proximal control. Like this case is a huge pecan aneurysm. When I opened uh, the dura and I realized the carotid is, is severely calcified, I cannot put any plasma in the carotid. So I need another space for, for proximal control. So I open the space between the force and B1, so-called the Parkinson triangle, to localize the carotid artery. So now I have the proximal control. Then I put the proximal control and this control on A1 to, uh, um, to, to just uh, decrease the flow into the aneurysm, to weaken the, uh, the, the tension of the aneurysm, and I'm using the coagulation to shrink in the aneurysm to make it smaller. Now using the clip shaping the aneurysm, now I can see the whole uh, segment of PCON to the P1 and P2 to make sure I didn't compromise any uh, important arteries and check with the Doppler. And so this case um, I just show if you, uh, have no space for proximal control in clinal space, the Parkinson triangle, you have to always prepare for the proximal control. And this is another case. It's a large intracaminous aneurysm. People, uh, the patient presenting with the double vision. So I, uh, peeling off the dura, exposed the later wall, the cavernous sinus, and I opened the Parkinson triangle to localize the carotids, we didn't, you do, and you can see this is the sixth nerve. This is uh, aneurysm. And the oculomotor nerve is overlying the uh, aneurysm so that the, people, uh, the patient has a double vision. So you, you can see, now I have the proximal control in Parkinson's triangle, so I can shrink in the aneurysm and put the pilot clip. But I didn't catch the whole segment of the neck, so I will shrink down the aneurysm, then you permit your rupture. But since I had the proximal control, I just put a clip and lessen the bleeding, and then I have time to do the clipping. When I do the clip, now I open the dura. Why? Because if you cause the bleeding from the aneurysm before opening the dura, then all the bleeding will not gush into the brain. So when I secure the aneurysm, now I open the dura to make sure that I catch the whole aneurysm. So this is another case that I show you how to open the Parkinson triangle to make the proximal control. And also the cranial phangioma. Uh, you did the similar techniques, but now you have to open the serum fissure to elevate the frontal lobe like this one, or this one. And this is the interrupted picture. If you remove the uh, clinoids, if you remove the whole ring surrounding the carotid and the phosphor lamin surrounding the optic nerve, you can widen the space into the, uh, between the optic nerve and the carotid, and you open the sylvian so that you can elevate the frontal to expose the, uh, the opposite side of the optic nerve. So you can show the pituitary stalk below the optic nerve through this window. And also, when you remove the tumor, you can see the pituitary stalk immobilize the optic nerve. You, you, you can either see the carotid uh, in the opposite side. So this approach is very good for the uh, uh, cranial pharyngioma. Then like Professor Sham uh, showed the case, the level two uh, techniques, you, you can deal with the clinal meningioma. It's similar to the uh, spinal wing meningioma, but the difference is you have to open the sylvan, you follow the N1 segment into the tumor. Because the clinal meningioma, the tumor always encasing the, the carotis, but you have to follow the sylvan, follow the M1. Then you remove the clinal, you can you can follow the proximal carotid 
and follow the diesel carotid, then within the tumor, you can preserve the carotid. This is, a, this is a more safe to do the uh, clinal meningioma. So this is a similar case as the Professor Shaw showed. Now, if you have all these techniques and you have, if you know how to uh, totally expose the capillary sinus, then this is very easy for you to deal with the, uh, the lesion within the macroscape because the, macro, the roof of the macroscape is very thin. You just open the macroscape, you can expose the gazerin ganglion and the trigeminal nerve. So for most of the uh, trigeminal schonoma, I just do the extradural peeling and opening the macroscape. And sometimes I cut the temporal base dura, expose the tentorium, and I cut the tentorium to widen the aperture of the macroscape. So like this case is the type A or type D is a very simple if you know how to do the extradural peeling and open the macroscape. So this picture show that I do the extradural peeling and actually the tumor is bulging from the Mavis cave and you open the Mavis cave, remove the decompress, the debulk the tumor and you can always find the uh, nerve fibers overlying the, uh, the tumor. So be careful, you remove the tumor and preserve the most of the uh, trigeminal nerve fibers. So if you uh, know how to open the Mavis cave and if you know how to cut the tentorium. Now you can deal with the pathology surrounding the cella, supercella, interpeduncular, and additional, the preponding space. So this case showed, you do the extra dura exposure, expose the macroscape and gazerin ganglion. Then you cut the uh, temporal base dura, expose the tentorium, and you cut the tentorium you can follow the whole segment of the trigeminal nerve down to the preponding space, down to its brainstem. So from this approach, actually following the axis of trigeminal nerve, you can deal with the, every type of the trigeminal schonoma and also the lesion in the pumps. So like this case, this is a type B and type C, the dumbbell type or the uh, posterior fossa type of the schonoma is very easy. You open the uh, macroscape and open the tentorium following the tumor down to the brainstem. Like this case, you open the macroscape and you de debulk the tumor and you find the nerve fibers and following the nerve fibers down to the brainstem. So this is post up. So this is a uh, very easy to remove the trigeminal schonoma if you know how to do it. And for all these post-op MRI, you can see that we all, we all preserve the trigeminal nerve, like you see in the post-op MRI. So if you are equipped more advanced techniques, so now you are at a level three. At the level three, you can deal with more complex pathology, like this one. This is the basilar apex aneurysm. The, to deal with the basilar apex aneurysm, the additional techniques is you have to open the oculomotor window. You have to free the oculomotor nerve so that you can widen the space to, uh, to mobilize the oculomotor laterally. You can uh, widen any the space into the preponding fossa, it facilitating to put the proximal control. Also, you have to remove the PCP if it's prominent, it's in your way uh, to, uh, to your proximal control. So you have to mobilize the oculomotor nerve, you have to remove the PCP. And also you have to open the sylvium. So in this case, it's a vessel apex, you can see I, I free the whole segment of the oculomotor uh, from the oculomotor membrane, so I can mobilize the third nerve. If you can mobilize the third nerve, then you can remove the PCP. It's uh, more safe to do uh, to remove the PCP using the bony cusa, but without the bony cusa, you have to be careful just using the the drill, the diamond drill, and 
be careful, don't put any cotton surrounding your surgical field, otherwise you caught, uh, you know, the drill will catch the cotton and injury the, all the tissue surroundings. So you mobilize the third nerve, you, you uh, remove the PCP, then you can expose the, the adequate segment of the basilar, uh, basilar trunk and expose the uh, bilateral uh, both sides of the SCA and the PCA. So now you have the space for the prostate control. Then you can use the shrink. And reason, then the permanent click is the simplest step of the aneurysm clicking. Also, if uh, you, it depends on the, uh, the aneurysm, the, sometimes it's a high line or low line. If the aneurysm is low line, you have to cut the tentorium to get more space for the prosmone control. Like this one, this is very large, uh, sometimes something like a fuse for any reason. And as usual, I do the dura peeling, I cut a meningobital fissure, uh, dura fold, do the dura peeling just beginning below the superior orbital fissure, peeling off the dura and just inject the TCO between the V1 and V2, and keep uh, peeling the dura back off, and expose the ACP, and remove the ACP. Then I cut the dura down to the base and extend the dura excision bilaterally to remove the outer ring so that I can mobilize the carotids to, to widen the window. And I have to open the sylvan to expose the whole segment of the carotid. Now I free the oculomotor nerve from the oculomotor triangle and free the, the oculomotor and expose the PCP. Uh, I remove the PCP so that I had a window to access to the prosmo basilar trunk so that I had the prosmo control. Using coagulation to shrink down the aneurysm. And I using the clip shaping technique. Just shaping the aneurysm to make it, uh, using the coagulation, make it smaller and make the, the shaping easier. and just watch every uh, perforators of the basilar apex and trunk. So this is the post-op and you can see there's no infarction in the brain stand from the post-op MRI. Also, uh, if you at the level three, now you have uh, qualifies to deal with the invasive macroadenoma. For the macroadenoma, you have to know how the growth pattern of the, um, the adenoma. Sometimes these, uh, they, uh, the growth superiorly and into the supracellular region, they're growing backwards into the oculomotor window, and even down below the uh, hippocampus, the below the tentorium. And also they can come down in the infratemporal fossa, like Professor Shah mentioned. So this animation shows the tumor, the growth pattern, the growth superiorly into the superior uh, cellar region and backward into the oculomotor wind, uh, triangle and downward maybe into the in, infratemporal fossa. So from, from, from the MRI, you can see this tumor is within the cavernous sinus. Then it grow laterally and backwards and within the oculomotor window, or also downwards into the infratemporal fossa. So if you know the growth pattern of the macroadenoma, so now you know the most important thing is if the tumor extends, then the nerve are stretched at the anchor, uh, where the anchor to the dura. 
So when you deal with the, the huge uh, invasive pituitary macroadenoma, remember you have to release all the nerves uh, step by step, all the nerves from the dura. Otherwise, because you remove the tumor between each nerve, window between each nerve, if you free all these nerve, then you can widen the window and lessen the injury to the nerve. So like this case, at the beginning, I usually the, the clinoid already eroded by the tumor. It's, just, it's very easy to remove the clinoid. If you remove the clinoid, sometimes the tumor is gushing out by the pressure. So you remove a little bit tumor to expose the carotid within the uh, clinoid portion. Then you mobilize the third nerve. You open the roof into the, uh, of the cavernous sinus. Then you can, uh, open the window between the third nerve and the trochlear nerve to remove the tumor and expose the intracavernous carotids. And now, then you remove, you move the microscope to the Parkinson triangle. You open the Parkinson triangle, remove the tumor, also follow the carotids. And at this stage, you have to localize the sick nerve. Now you move, uh, move the next step is the, between the V2 and V3. Then you can remove the tumors in the supracellular region. You expose the whole segment of carotid, like I mentioned uh, in the case of cranial phangioma. You mobilize the carotids, you mobilize the optic nerve to remove the tumor in the supracellular region. And also you can remove the tumor down to the uh, different cella, down to the uh, cellular region. And this is the uh, post-op picture. As you can see, I delineate each uh, cranial nerve. I uh, free all these nerves from the dura, and also I remove the tumor following the carotid. So this is the key steps when you're dealing with the uh, invasive uh, macroepithelial macroadenoma. Now, if you, are uh, really uh, familiar with all these techniques surrounding the cavernous sinus. Now you are equipment with the most advanced techniques. You are now at the level four. At the level four, you have to know how to uh, remove the petrous bone. Then you can open the space into the posterior fossa. If you uh, totally uh, uh, do all the steps, you can deal with the large pathologies extending from the uh, supracella, cella prepounding space, and down to the posterior fossa, like the petroclavo meningioma. Like, we, like as you know, uh, the petroclavo meningioma city medial to the IAC and posterior to a gasoline ganglion. The large petroclavo meningioma could be occupied the supracella in the pedunculate and prepounding space. So this kind of the, the lesion Actually, the transcavernous approach, I think, is the best approach for petroclavial meningioma. And when you deal with the petroclavial meningioma, we have three major obstacles to the view. The first one is the anterior clonal process, because you, you have to remove the anterior clonal processes to access to the cellar and supracellar region. The second obstacle is the tentorian and posterior clinal. If you incise, divide the tentorium. If you remove the posterior clinoid, like I mentioned, you can open the space to the interpeduncular and preponding space. And the third obstacle is the anterior petrus. If you remove the anterior petrus, then you can open the dura and then you can expose the space in the posterior fossa. Even you can expose the IAC to localize the seven and eight nerves. So this picture shows three obstacles in different trajectory to deal with the petroclival meningioma. So it's very complex when you do the petroclival meningioma, but you have to know the step-by-step. Step. You have to remove the first obstacles. You have to free the carotid, the optic nerve. Then you have to remove the second obstacles. You have to open the macroscape dividing the tentorium, remove the uh, PCP. You can mobilize the trigenome nerve. You can uh, cut the grouper ligament to localize the sixth nerve. 
then you remove the third obstacles, you remove the anterior petrus, then you can uh, remove the tumor down to the posterior fossa. So like this case, the first step, I do the extradural peeling, then totally expose the little wall of the cavernous sinus, and I remove the ICP. I remove the first obstacles of the view to the petrol collaboration. I open the dura and also I open the microscope. Then the second stage is I do the anterior petrosectomy. As you see, I open the microscope, then I cut the tentorium down to the posterior fossa. So as you see, I follow the trigeminal nerve into the posterior fossa because I already removed the uh, uh, the anterior petrous parts. And if you, now you can mobilize the trigeminal nerve to see the round and to localize the sixth nerve. And you can do, if you prepare everything, now the tumor removal uh, is efficiently within short time. And this is this post-op picture. Most of people are uh, actually, they has a transient uh, neurologic deficit uh, for the uh, 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 like uh, uh, eye movements. But in Taiwan, in Taipei, we have very good uh, Chinese medicine. So I, I always send the patient, refer the patient for acupuncture. So usually within six months, if the nerves is intact, usually within six months, they totally recover the post-op uh, neurologic deficit. So this is case, and also this case, I all do the transcavenous approach. So this uh, video showed how we, uh, sorry. Sorry, I don't, I don't know why, what happened. This is a 30-year-old female with unsteady gait dysphagia and dysarthria. MRI showed a giant petroclival tumor. This case we published in neurosurgical focus. The tumor is a large petroclival tumor. Extended down to the lower clivus, pushed to the stalk and ICA anteriorly. It involved microscape and basilar artery. Under general anesthesia, the patient was in supine position. The head was fixed by Mayfield head holder. A curvilinear skin incision was made over the frontal temporal region. A standard perional craniotomy along with zygoma fracture was performed. Additional bone drilling was carried out down to the temporal base. Flatten the sphenoid wing and expose the periorbital. Cut the medical orbital fold. Open the superior orbital fissure. Fill the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Inject tissue glue between V1 and V2 for hypostasis. When I remove the pictures, coagulate and cut the middle meningeal artery. Expose V3 and GSPA. Perform the anterior tetrasectomy. Check the location for Petra's ICA. Remove ACP extradurally. Drill the optic strut and remove ACP. Finish the extradural bony work. So if we prepare everything. This is the surgical view of transmechal's case, transcantorial approach in this case. We cut the dura from ACP tip to Petra's apex. A T-shaped durotomy. If you prepare everything, then tumor removal will become simple and more efficiently uh, within short time. Then you step-by-step step to free all the nerves from the upper nerve down to the approach. Dura propria was peeled to the edge of incisura. The dura was cut along the green dots.
use QSA to debug the tumor. As you see, I free the octal nerve and free the octal motor nerve. And free the, also free the carotids to mobilize all these structures to facilitate the tumor removal. Dissect the superior surface of the tumor away from the third ventricular floor. Expose the ACA and MCA. Continue debulking. Dissect tumor from the space created by anterior intersection. You see, if you mobilize the trigeminal, you can localize the system and also remove the tumor within the medical scape. Cut the tumor base. And you cut the tumor just behind the Gruber ligament is safe. Dissect the tumor from the brain state. Because the six nerves is within the Gruber ligament. Dissect so it, around the tumor. And finally, remove it. So as you see, you can expose very wide space into the supracellar, cella, prepontine, interpetuncular, and posterior fossa. Now I close the dura. And the, for the dura defect, I always put the fat and overlie by the some uh, like dura or the hemo patch and seal with the glue. Another case, um, I just want to show, this is the same uh, steps. I just want to show, as I mentioned, uh, you remove the tumor behind the gruber ligament then you open the space between the V1 and the trochlear nerve. You can always localize the six nerves within the uh, dorelle canals. So this is uh, the, another case which I show how I localize the six nerve. And this is a post-oven line. Pretemporal transcavernous transcavernous with this right technique, you can also formation. This is a 57 year old brain man with progressive like headaches, case. nausea, vomiting, drowsiness, and unsteady gait for five days. The brain CT showed a heterogeneous high density lesion at the right aspect of the pons. The MR study was compatible with a cavernous male formation with recent intralesional hemorrhage at right side pons. The cortical spinal tracts were pushed backward by the cavernous malformation. So as I showed, if you open the space to the pons lesion by my techniques, you can deal with such a lesion within the pons. And this animation shows the lesion related to the structures of the cavernous sinus. I can choose the good corridor to this lesion. Under general anesthesia, the patient was in supine position. The head was fixed by Mayfield head holder. A standard terional craniotomy was performed with zygoma fracture. Flatten the spinal wing. Expose the periorbita. Peel the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus.
Yeah, most of the time I use in the sharp dissection. Inject tissue glues for hemostasis. Remove the ACP extradurally. Sometimes the ACP is uh, pneumatized, so be careful. You have to put a uh, put a little bit muscle uh, in prevent of uh, open the Mancos cave. Cut the dura along the tentorium horizontally. You open the Mancos cave. Then you expose the tentorium. Open the liliquis membrane. Now you can divide the tentorium to widely expose the preponding space. Expose the fourth nerve. A vertical cut at the tentorium. Connect the vertical and horizontal cuts to release the tentorium. I learned these techniques as intraoperative neuromonitoring, some cortical motor tract mapping. A small cortical incision was made. Now you choose the safety zone into the lesion, and actually the removal lesion is become the simplest steps of the whole surgery. At Sanford, in the interest of time, if you don't mind, okay, could we wrap up after the no, please finish this? Uh, and if you have any other important points to make, and then okay. we'll try one or two questions if that's okay. I think this is the last case, right? So, for cavernous male formation located at so I would like to thank you all because I have a chance to introduce my experience in the cavernous sinus surgery. And also I have to thank my great teachers, Professor Dr. Krishit and Professor Amarti and Professor Yasakyo and also our uh, good friends, Professor uh, Evandro and Dolank. I learned a lot from them. And uh, it's my honor to uh, join their, uh, their world and I also um, enjoy all their, uh, their experience and techniques. And in, our, in Taipei, in my department, uh, we had five different uh, uh, topics of the dissection course uh, in my department. And all of you are welcome. But because the uh, COVID-19, so some of the courses are postponed uh, next year. And also uh, we are welcome to international fellows to my department because uh, we provide, pro pro provide a free, a lunch and dinner during weekdays and also very cheap accommodations and welcome. And also thank you everyone. Thank you. Sam, thank you very much. That was a very, very impressive talk. Some very advanced um, operations demonstrated there. I think it built very nicely from what we heard from, uh, um, from our previous speaker where we looked at the anatomy in great detail, very beautifully, and then you had a very nice system for people to progress uh, through the steps. And I think that's an important point to make. We've got you know almost 200 people at least watching, maybe more. And I think that's quite an important point to make that these are advanced techniques and you have to build up to it slowly. I'm sure you'd agree, Sanford. Would that be a fair comment to make? Yeah. So 
these are things that you know you can try and work through the levels. These, these videos are going to be on YouTube. You can watch them, look at the anatomy carefully. I wouldn't attempt any of these things unless you understood the anatomy well, and then you can work through the levels. Um, going back to my point that some of the people here watching may be less advanced, and, and you, you sort of touched upon this, and while I look for a question from our audience, would you mind just explaining to everyone present here, when you're cutting the distal dual ring and its relationship to the adventitia of the carotid, you spent a lot of time early on talking about cutting the distal dual ring, and could you just talk us through its relationship to the adventitia of the carotid and how when people are starting to do this procedure, what important anatomy they need to understand so they don't injure into the carotid? And I think this is a very good question because I did mention uh, in my talk that when I removed the outer ring, actually there's a, uh, there's a, a small technique. When you remove the clinoid, you have to not notify there's always the membrane surrounding the carotid. It's the extension of the oculomotor membrane. So usually I can cut the membrane in the clinal portion so I can inject the tissue within this membrane. And this membrane guides you to remove the artery ring. I cut the ring. I have to open the membrane to really localize the, the wall of the, caver, of the carotid. Then if you cut the ring, I always use the blunt tip, the scissor. So I cut a ring along the, cis, the carotid only after I open the membrane. Do you know what I mean? Because the oculomotor membrane, the extension of oculomotor membrane covering the clinal portion of the carotid and fused with the outer ring. So you have to open the membrane it yes. means that you free the both sides of the ring so that you cut the ring, you can visualize the, the ring, the relation to the carotis. Yeah. And, and Sanford, also, you had a very nice picture in one of your early bits. You, you, the ring joins, merges with the adventitia of the carotid, doesn't it? And yeah. so you have to cut it round as a ring. So people, when they start to do this, unless they cut towards the carotid, you can very easily injure the carotid. You had a beautiful picture, I think, demonstrating that, right? Just probably an important point to highlight mm -hmm. how uh, the distal dual ring fuses with the adventitia of the carotid. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, sure. And so that's a very, a very important thing. Um, now, I've got a question from, and then we'll move on to Professor Goh, but the, from Harshad Parak, who's asking, uh, would you remove the, or drill the anterior clinoid extradurally or intradurally for clipping of aneurysm? So I think the question here is, a lot of people, in different to skull based tumors, but aneurysms advocate drilling intradurally. Now, you're a very experienced surgeon, obviously. What would you advise people who are well, both for yourself and starting out? What would you advise them? Yes, I actually, these questions I saw a lot of debates from Dr. Christian uh, de Oliveira. Uh, Dr. Christian prefers extradural uh, clinal, clinal deformity drilling, and de Oliveira likes intradural. But for me, uh, of course, uh, I think uh, extradural drilling is the best because it don't cause a lot of the bony dust uh, into the intradural space. Also, uh, if you familiar with the anatomy, actually you see everything, even there behind the dura, actually you see everything on your mind. So never mind that you didn't see the uh, landmark of the, the structures. You see everything, uh, all of the dura. But Extradural drilling is more safer than intradural drilling. If you saw the video from the one who do the intradural drilling surrounding the aneurysm, always looks terrible. So if you do the extradural drilling, actually there's a barrier uh, there protecting you from the aneurysm. So for me, I like extradural drilling because it's uh, more safer and actually it won't cause any bony dust uh, into the intradural space. Thank you, so there you've heard, you've heard a view there.